like many other companies, we've really had to accelerate our own digital transformation in Heineken. Um, you know, a lot of our employees have had to adapt with you know, to new ways of working, um, to collaborating online, remotely, etc. So we really needed to find ways to support and, our, and develop our employees in that environment. Um, so actually, although we were on a, a journey to transform our learning landscape in Heineken, the result of COVID is actually what accelerated it. So in June this year, we launched a global learning platform, a new learning platform. We did have a legacy platform before, which was not used at all. <laughs> um, and so we really needed to sort of up our game there. Um, and this platform now is, is available to all 85,000 employees at Heineken. Um, we call it My Learning. And uh, within the platform, we have access now to all of our functional academy content. So that's for each of our eight academies. We have supply chain, finance, commerce, et cetera. Um, and in addition to that, we also have some cross-functional content available uh, and accessible to all employees as well. And that's powered by LinkedIn Learning. So we use LinkedIn Learning's content as our global um, catalog. So we've done it. We've done quite a lot of work, and and I'll share a little bit more about some of the things that we've done even more recently uh, since that launch um, on on other areas as well. Great. So it's um you know it's it's kind of provided an opportunity, I suppose, given driven you know given the huge need there is to get something up and running to really push forward projects. But well, it sounds like two things really from what you've said: centralizing things that were maybe quite dispersed and, and variegated across the organization, but also um, getting people to actually use things. Because of course, as, as you said, the, the elephant in the room with legacy platforms is they tend not really to be used apart from for compliance. So, so it's a it's a big opportunity there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Compliance driven learning was something we were well known for prior to all of these changes. That, that's an interesting question, actually, and we'll, we'll cover that more, which is um, the the rebranding, I suppose, of, of, of learning teams around the digital initiative and around um, upskilling as opposed to compliance. That's that's a really interesting dimension. And so moving directly on to that, could you tell us about the kind of projects that you're working on at the moment and um, whether the main themes of the projects you're working on have stayed the same or have evolved? Yeah, so I'm, I mentioned, um, Toby, just before that we we were on a journey to transforming our learning lands landscape anyway in Heineken, and there were many reasons for that, one of which we, we knew at um, sort of in back in 2019 that what we had in place just simply wasn't uh, cutting the mustard, for lack of a better word, in terms of employee experience, um, engagement, the content that we had in our legacy systems was not scalable, um, it also wasn't that engaging. Um, it was very much sort of older e-learning uh, digital format. So we really knew that something needed to change there anyway. And we were moving and progressing towards that. <clears throat> but what came into flourishing more recently, so this year, was a, dig a, a global digital upskilling initiative, which we started to work on early in the year, um, mainly because we added a new uh, pillar to our organizational a strategy, which was to connect in a digital world. So based on this, we knew that we needed to also upskill our employees to a level that they understand the common language needed to actually succeed in a digital age. And this is where we built DigiFit, which is our global digital upskilling initiative, now also accessible to all 85,000 of our employees. Um, DigiFit is powered by, we, we use both my learning um, but also uh, what we call our in-house DigiBot, which is a personal digital assistant. Um, this digital assistant, assistant is powered by Magpie, which is Filtered Solution. Um, and it's, it's working really well. What we, we find because of course, um, we are a very globally matrix organization. We have 85 operating companies across the, the world, many of which are very local in terms of their market needs, in terms of their um, local learning strategies. So we, we needed to make sure that we could find a robust solution that could scale across all of those operating companies, but still be able to deliver on the, 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 the key framework that we had created around this digital upskilling initiative. So, um, you know, that's, a, that's been a big area of focus for us and will continue to be a big area of focus for us in terms of campaigning, in terms of driving engagement, over the coming years. It's, it's really a key part of our organizational strategy, as I said. 
So there's there's a couple of things and I wanted to 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 comment on that and and one of them is just to ask um where on earth um did you um did you come up with that name um digifit from because the concept of digital fitness is is extremely strong um I was I was when we were talking initially I was kind of green with envy that we didn't come up with that and it was like a Heineken <laughs> thing now um because it is quite strong because it's like it's, it's often been a really good way of reframing other things such as mental health for example if you talk about fitness you tap into this idea of like are you doing okay not are you some kind of super geek who knows all about ai and blockchain but are you fit for purpose with this stuff where did that where did that idea come from and that that brand yeah that's a great question i we have a very creative uh, bunch of people working in in our team in heineken and uh, we kind of threw around a couple of ideas but the reason why I coined the term DigiFit, actually. I thought, okay, exactly as you say, is what can we anchor all of this off? How can we campaign this? How can we create a story around it that's really going to stick and resonate? And fitness, of course, is one of the, the first things that, that came to mind. Um, and it literally was a matter of thinking about digital and fitness and just combining the two words together. And um, it's amazing how so many um, amazing sort of themes and narratives have been able to emerge from that um, uh, that that specific topic or should I say that name um, so for example now we're also we're building what we call a workout plan which will also be recommended to all of our 80,000 employees in the coming months and this is a, a plan that um, enables employees to have meaningful conversations with their managers around what they need to learn in the context of their personal development plans around digital upskilling so, digital fitness so we I think we you know I if I do say so myself I think we hit the nail on the head with the GFIT <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah and and that example um calling a, a conversation with a manager a workout plan is such a good way of reframing in a really positive light um something which could be perceived negatively and just kind of changing it and um I think this um, this analogy of seeing your digital support systems as like a personal trainer, you know, to offer guidance, to kind of um, provide a plan, but actually putting the onus of the work squarely on the user is is really, really cool. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll try not to steal it too much from <laughs> and I'll leave it with your, your concept. Um, the other the other question I had is, um, can you give the audience a sense of how you accomplished what is probably the most impressive characteristic of this is that you have 85 operating companies um, operating across, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds of different brands and territories. Um, how on earth does the technology you have personalized to to that level, like to those audiences? And, you know, did you have to overcome any challenges to make it work, you know, to actually make what people see relevant to their particular situation? Because that, to be honest, local context seems to me like the issue upon which any initiative like this would founder. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's a really good question. And I think maybe to start, we were, we were, I don't know if the word's fortunate, but we um, certainly were in a good position when we started because uh, we knew based on our organizational strategy and, and ambition and based on our um, senior sort of executive engagement that we would be able to drive this from the center um, and, and really deliver to all of our opcos. So we built a framework around digital upskilling from the center. And what we needed to do was make sure we could find technology that would scale that, but also then adapt. So for example, um, within the framework, we had five different pillars, um, one being um, consumer experience, so understanding the um, importance of consumer um, experience, omni-channel experience, et cetera. Another pillar being um, understanding digital technologies, uh, the, the other one, digital trends um, happening in the world around us, like AI, blockchain, et cetera. We also focused on digital productivity and then what mindsets also are needed to uh, succeed in the digital age. But of course, as you rightly mentioned, this framework is all well and good, but I as an individual might not need to know everything that sits under all of those frameworks to a level of um, expertise or mastery that somebody else in a different role or different opco or different function needs to know. So we needed to make sure that whatever solution, whatever technology that we, um, we used would be able to flex and adapt and personalize um, content recommendations within that framework to personal needs. Um, and this is where Magpie came in. So because Magpie works off an AI and uh, machine learning uh, recommendation uh, 
as a sorry as a AI machine learning recommendation platform, we were able to create the framework around um, around the, the the technology that enabled that kind of personalization. So, um, to give an idea, when a learner uh, is sort of prompted to go and visit Magpie, which we call Digibot. Um, they are then met with a, a couple of questions from a chat box, box which, which we have also behind that done a lot of work with filters to actually map the questions from that chat box to competencies um, that we've developed around these five foundations. So a learner will, um, will then respond to the chat box questions and then get um, sort of uh, assigned a unique skills signature and based on that skill signature, they will receive content recommendations that really are um, supportive of achieving their learning goals. So this is what's really helped us. Of course, other things like the fact that um, we were able to, to um, you know, use different languages as well in the platform was a big tick box for us because being 85 operating companies and um, four sort of main global languages, we simply wouldn't be able to do this without being able to cater to those sorts of requirements. So these are the sorts of things that we really were able to achieve through the right technology, I would say, and the right partnership, um, you know, with those technology providers. Excellent, excellent. Thank, thank you for that. And it, the, the language question for me seems important as well. If we use a personal trainer analogy, who could imagine a personal trainer who wasn't talking to you in your in your native language or at least very close to it? You know, it's just not the same, is it? Um, so um, there's the next point I wanted to discuss is like what has the impact of the um, basically we've seen that um, with in these other filtered forum discussions that the rapid adoption of digital tools in all respects has sort of applied pressure to learning ecosystems but it's had interesting effects it's not like a rising tide that's lifted all boats these learning ecosystems have been tested and some platforms have fared well and others have been changed mm. um i i just want to note as well there was a question about um what um what lms you were referring to um lms provider i i would suggest that we politely don't answer that question for now and just kind of maybe that that can be dealt with one-to-one -one afterwards um sure. nicole just just to kind of be fair to everyone here but but in terms of that question how has the learning ecosystem changed in this kind of rapid uptake of digital technology and digital tools yeah that you know i think um one thing to probably mention is we didn't do sort of robust benchmarking against um our sort of learning behavior and heineken prior to this and there are reasons for that. One of which I mentioned earlier is that we really just were compliance driven before this big change. And a lot of the learning that we did online was, was compliance learning. So we didn't really have any, anything to benchmark against and not internally anyway. Um, but I, I, I'm quite confident that based on the usage that we see now in our platforms, um, that, that if things hadn't happened the way they did this year, <laughs> I don't know that the numbers would be as good as they are right now. Uh, to give you an idea, we, you know, we have about 30% adoption um, five months into launch, and that might not seem like a good number, but really it, it is pretty good. If you, if you really think all things considered, we don't have any compliance learning in, in those new uh, platforms. So it's really about pull marketing. It's about curiosity, people wanting to go there because they're motivated to learn. We have great, um, uh, rates of engaged quality learners and this is again I think something that's telling of um, you know not only the times people being you know much more accustomed to using digital tools now um, and feeling more almost acquainted with and familiar with using them for learning um, or at least forced to to use them for learning now um, but I, I so it is a, a sign of that but I think it's also a, a, a sign of the accomplishments that we've made in terms of changing um, the, the learning uh, landscape in Heineken and really, really stepping up our game in, game in a massive way to deliver to the needs of users who, you know, have completely different personal digital experiences to what they typically do in their, in, in their working lives. So I think that's also uh, got a lot to do with it. And, and just on um, how are you um, capturing data from 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 this change because obviously what's been what's been deployed is um, an ecosystem that is combining um, the um, the existing uh, legacy LMS um, a um, the my learning platform so a new kind of learning experience platform and then um, the magpie technology on top of that how how are you managing to knit this together 
Yeah, so um, I'm very pleased to say that actually just yesterday we uh, launched our what we call our unicorn Power BI dashboard. <laughs> and the reason for the name is, uh, I don't know, maybe many of you in the call can resonate with this, but trying to pull data from so many different learning, because, uh, sorry, learning platforms into one um, integrated dashboard Sounds like an easy task when you've got all that great Power BI technology and all that great, you know, tooling to do it. But it, it's not it's not as easy as you think. So um, we're, we're pretty pleased that we've got to that point um, and, and quite quickly, uh, albeit. And um, so now what we have is, as I mentioned, it's a it's a dashboard, a Power BI dashboard, which contains all the data um, relevant to to what's happening in um, my HR learning, which is our LMS, which is where all of our compliance training sits now. And then also what happens in my learning, so all the functional academy um, uh, learning, but also some of our cross-functional offers like DigiFit, um, like LinkedIn Learning uh, Library, etc. And then of course uh, DigiBot as well. So, so we're really pleased with that. It is MVP, so you know we're really trying to take a <laughs> start small mindset, and we continue to develop and evolve that. And I can imagine because we're focusing a lot now on on continuing to evolve our learning technology stack, but there will be more tools and more uh, data to include there uh, going forward as well. There's some, there's some great questions um, stacking up as well um, in, in, in the chat. And, um, and I think that um, we should, um, and they are kind of pertaining to this question um, around reporting. So um, we might come back to them, I think at the end, but just, just one um, um, point I want to draw out is, um, I have a question from someone who is an anonymous attendee, excitingly, um, <laughs> about um, what all this work, uh, which sounds amazing, has meant for other learning libraries. So has it shown other libraries that are or aren't working? Um, so I don't know what the landscape was like before. Um, obviously, we do tend to see LinkedIn learning perform extremely well, you know, across as when it's being used in this kind of way. Um, are there other libraries? And again, you don't have to don't have to name them, but are there other things that you've sort of taken a backseat or things you've consolidated? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, so we we use LinkedIn learning as our global content catalog. And I have to say, for more of the functional learning, we do partner with vendors who do the functional side of things. So it's quite difficult to compare or correlate, um, you know, what the data says about people who, uh, about LinkedIn learning versus and um, what the data is saying about the functional content, because it's just not audience uh, wide, it's really vertical segments. So um, at the moment, we're, I think we're still quite early days. Um, but I do think that for sure, um, the, the, the Power BI dashboards that we've got in place now will shine a spotlight on the stuff that's not working so well. Um, and that's one of the great things about having data is, and, and, and you know, I, I've, I, I talk about this all the time, data is our best friend when it comes to improving experience and um, ensuring that we have the right content. And another reason why Filtered is great because they, there's also these mechanisms to really sift out data, um, sorry, content that that isn't relevant, that isn't working in these platforms. But good question, and I'll, I'll you know, if, if Anonymous wants to become unanonymous, maybe we can connect and I'll, I'll let you know later how, how it gets on. Yeah, I, I definitely, on, on a serious point, I, I definitely think that um, we should um, do a, um, we can probably do a follow-up uh, discussion that, that, that for some of the audience that drills into more of a kind of technical background of the ecosystem and how it works, because I'm sure that people will be fascinated uh, to, to discover more. Um, and just to, um, just before we move on to your view on the key trends, could you just um, hit us, you mentioned 30% adoption, um, that's where you are, that's the proof in the pudding, right? Like, did people use it? Can you hit us with any other numbers that, that show that there's, um, that, um, that there's been a, a step change that you're suggesting in, in kind of self-driven development and away from compliance? Yeah, I'm, uh, so I, I could probably mention a couple, um, uh, and I'm trying to think off the top of the, my head now, but uh, for example, we, we're seeing a lot of people um, take the time to rate content to, to actually, you know, instead of just consuming it to actually give their reviews to rate it. And I think that's also very powerful because it says something about people's behavior around learning. You know, no one's, no one's forced to do that, but by doing that, it's saying something about the fact that they, they really do take time and they, they want to um, provide their input, their insight, their feedback. And, 
Um, at the moment, our content rating, of course, with LinkedIn Learning being there, you know, it's, it's bringing the, the ratings up quite significantly, but uh, at the moment, it's about 4.6 out of five stars on, on the platform, which is great. Um, and we see also many, I mean, tens of thousands of hours spent in the last five months um, on LinkedIn Learning. And I don't want to say these are the exact numbers, but I, I can say it's over 10,000 mark now of hours spent just on LinkedIn Learning alone. And that's completely unprecedented. Like I say, no one's being forced to do this. Um, so, so I think actually I also um, our number of engaged quality learners, which is basically learners going back and completing content, et cetera, is when we look at industry ben benchmarks against other organizations um, who have done something similar to what we have, we, I was speaking with, with LinkedIn Learning yesterday, actually, we are, we are in the top three in terms of that uh, engaged quality learner um, status, which I'm, I think is a very good sign that we're in the, going in the right direction. So this really shows the difference that pulling, um, pulling an integrated ecosystem together around a focus that's simple enough for everyone to understand changes the nature of engagement. You're not just saying, hey, let's become a learning culture, let's become a learning company. You're saying, we need to do something around digital fitness and you're using that language and that brand and say, so, yeah, I agree. Those, those numbers sound a lot, a lot higher than when it's launched as a kind of, well, you're, you're on furlough, you can't work. So off you go, you better go and Absolutely. do some learning, you know? Absolutely. And you know, yeah, all things considered exactly. There's all that going on as well. Um, so I don't know, maybe if that wasn't the case, the numbers might've been even better, but they are just numbers as well. Numbers don't say enough. So, and I'm aware of that. And I think this is what our next phase in the journey will be is actually what is the impact um, that this is making in terms of performance um, on the business. Absolutely. And um, we're coming to the end of the, uh, the discussion portion of this because there's so many questions. So um, just for a few minutes, um, could you give us your take on what you think the key trends for organizational learning are going to be over the next year? I'm sure everyone's dying to hear what you think of the yeah, so I think, you know, what we all know that skills are changing as fast as we're learning them at the moment. So I think what we really, certainly we at Heineken need to focus on and are really, you know, trying to focus on is um, building a strong learning strategy uh, that ensures employee skills are kept up to date, um, you know, while jobs continue to evolve with all of this technology. Um, we need to understand, you know, what skills are, are needed and, and what kind of tools can help us to understand that because we can't, this is not something that we can do without some form of automation, some form of intelligence to support us. Um, we need to know what new jobs are going to be created as a result of all these technological shifts and changes. And we need to know sort of what old jobs are no longer necessary, what new skills or how do we reskill for these, um, these jobs that aren't uh, necessary anymore. Um, so I'm a, I'm, I really think, uh, you know, we need to understand what our strengths are as humans in, in learning and development and also understand what um, AI strengths are to help us as humans in learning and development. Um, so I definitely think more tools, AI tools are going to be implemented certainly for us to support us. We're a huge organization. We, we just simply can't do this um, from the center with just a team of only five of us, <laughs> to be honest, um, on our own. And, um, and I think what we need to focus on is developing our own capabilities in, in areas that will support that. So for example, in understanding how to build a future-proof competency and capability frameworks, um, using the intelligence and the data we get from AI. And then also think, thinking about developing sort of ultra sticky learning campaigns, marketing to really bring that, that learner engagement to the platform. Because I, I do believe that that can't be done um, with technology alone. I think we need the human touch there. Yeah, for, for sure. And, and um, just to, again, um, hog, hog my, my position as the main um, interviewer here. Um, I know there's loads of questions, but just to, there seems to be a theme coming through um, all of what you've said and the success of the project and its gestation and its next steps, which is obviously skills and understanding skills and capabilities as they're changing for the organization. And I think that seems to be behind how it's been possible to achieve success with this because you've had um, that firm grounding. But mm. what you're saying is, is also really interesting in that, um, you know, we've been working in a space for, uh, for many years now, specifically um, in this in, with Magpie for, for three or four years. And um, 
we've seen the idea of what is AI really used for, what is machine learning really important for in organizational learning shift and change? You know, is it about powering a chatbot? We're going to have a natural language conversation. Um, you know, is it about understanding content? Is it about assessing people? And what you're saying is that um, in, in all of those key trends, you think it's actually skills. It's like the skill problem is sufficiently hard, but there's something that humans can do, but we need to bring automation to bear on that. We need automated processing of data. Does that, does that sound about, about right? Yeah, I think that you summarized that really well. I think um, absolutely you've hit the nail on the head. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for, for, for sharing that. And there's so much more to, to go for. Um, Sam, I'll hand over to you, I think, to pick out the, the juiciest uh, question um, from, from the discussion or maybe to pose some of your own. There's, there's quite a few in there. Cheers, Toby. And thanks, Nicole. That was, that was amazing, full of tons of value. Um, I do have lots of questions of my own, but I think we'll stick to the ones that have come in from the audience. Um, yeah, really good question. How do you curate recommendations from the plethora of learning content available? Yeah, so, um, well, with a lot of ease when we have partners like Filtered. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 in, in, all, in all honesty, um, when we started, I'll speak specifically around the digital upskilling initiative, so DigiFit. When we started this, one of our key criteria in a partner was to support us with exactly that, because we just knew we did not have the time, the resource, and even you know the expertise um, to to curate, to handpick that high quality content um, uh, from the internet, for example, so freemium content, because we didn't just want to rely on LinkedIn Learning, of course. That's very formal courses. We needed to have a wide range to cater to a wide range of learning styles and needs, etc. So, for us, um, it was a it was a very big um, and important criteria in our selection process. Um, not only did you know you felt it help with the sort of curation of external content but also in in the journey that we had to take and in heineken to curate our own internal content around um digital skills because of course these things were happening in heineken we we have many in fact a plethora of digital projects happening but the problem is we just haven't been able to curate them and put them in a place where everybody can see this is what's been going on uh, so that in itself was a journey and, and, and that we, we also got support with. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's unless you have a huge team of learning people able to support you with that, you really do need to have, um, well, I, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it on my own anyway. So you need, you need extra hands for that. Um, especially you can't, you know, you can't rely on uh, the machine in the beginning to just recommend that content and, and ensure that it's going to be, um, high quality, that it's going to be relevant. You really need to start the hand picking beforehand. Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's a very good um, ingredient, secret sauce to, the, to the, the whole sort of solution. Yeah, I mean, everyone's dealing with content overload, right? So it's just, you can't just chuck it in, like you said, and expect it to work. So yeah, um, yeah appreciate that. And thank you. I also appreciate the question from, from Pip there. That wasn't from me. So yeah, that set us up nicely. There's another really good question though about, um, are there any particular functions that have adopted the new solutions more sort of in terms of learner behavior? Yes, actually there, there are. Um, so the data's uh, are pointing to the fact that our supply chain are, but that could also be because, I mean, it's a bit of a bias number because it is our biggest function in Heineken. However, uh, having said that, supply chain are also doing a ton of, of sort of digital projects, um, activities, uh, it's, you know, top of mind. We have a, a big initiative called the Connected Brewery in Heineken. It's all about how we use Internet of Things, blockchain, AI, all of the big trends um, to really sort of, you know, optimize uh, what we do in production. So, so there's, there's a lot of um, activity happening there. Um, and I think now it's, it's, it's early to say exactly, you know, why perhaps one function is, is, is using solutions more than another uh, because we're quite early into, into this, yeah, the deployment. And also because we've not been using too much sort of learner marketing, so to speak. Um, and we're only just getting into that now, which is another super exciting topic. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how, how that progresses and what kind of insights it gleans for us going forward as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump in here because there's more interesting questions off the back of that. But 
when you say um, learner marketing, um, what what do you mean? Um, what, what what are we what are we talking about here? Is there anything interesting or unconventional or kind of innovative about what you're doing to kind of market and re-engage um, users? Yeah, so, well, um, interestingly, because we are a very much a federated organization, um, we work from the center and we've de developed all of these frameworks, we've um, implemented all these systems, but we rely heavily on our opcos to activate locally. And so what we've been doing is we've been building toolkits for them to uh, templates, basically, to, to really start to um, push, or should I say, pull learners into our systems. Um, and these are tactics that you can use, you can anchor it off things like the, the narrative of the organization at the moment. We've got a new CEO who has just come in and he talks a lot about being a learning organization, being curious, being in your growth zone. And these are things that really, we, you know, because we can tie it with what our senior leaders are, are talking about, it, 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 it has so much more resonance for our people. Similarly, if you look at what's happening in the world today, you read World Economic Forum and you know, you, you create a bit of a burning platform around why it's so important to upskill yourself. These are the kinds of tactics we use. Um, but equally, we have tools that enable this as well. So for example, in Filtered, we use um, a lot of the, um, the marketing tools that are available uh, from that platform to really tailor and target specific um, campaigns to specific audiences based on their, their needs, perhaps also um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very much around uh, segmentation. It's like consumer marketing. It's pretty much the same thing applied to learning. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a simple way to put it, isn't it? It's, 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 it is done in consumer marketing. That the hard thing is getting that over relied and implemented in, um, in, in, in large organizations that aren't used to it. And um, I wanted to, I want to, again, pick the next question. Um, so, Sam, you can pick the, the, the last one I think we do after this, which is um, the question from um, Stephanie. Um, she wants to know about the sort of metrics um, in your unicorn dashboard. And specifically, she wants to know what questions are asked to source performance data. I mean, maybe that's questions of users, maybe that's questions internally. And on that point, you mentioned supply chain um, are both big users of this and also undergoing big digital transformations, which for me suggests quite a good link there between learning and performance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, can you tell us more about those these measures and metrics in the in the in the dashboard as much as you can tell us obviously as well, because some of this is obviously quite sensitive stuff. Yeah, sure. No, Stephanie, you put me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so a great question, by the way. And it's also prompting me to think about what we need to do to improve our dashboards, which were launched yesterday. But at the moment, we really are, we, and, I, and I'm in the spirit of transparency, we're really at the beginning of that, um, that integrated data analytics uh, dashboard journey. So right now we have pretty uh, the bog standard data in there. And we're starting to look at sort of more, for example, unique, um, unique logins versus number of active users. That starts to say something about, as I was mentioning, this, um, this quality engagement. Um, and we're starting to, to talk more with the functions around what it is that um, you know, they're doing, what kind of initiatives they're doing in their opco, and also how they need to look at the data to support what they're doing. Because I have to say, um, we, we're really focusing more on breadth at the moment than depth. Um, we have to, we also have to take into consideration that our functions know more about what are going on, what's going on in their functions and what they need to try to performance in their function than, than perhaps what I do. But it's, it's my job to be a business partner to them to say, look at the data in this way, look at these insights, see what actions these um, insights can actually provide um, for you. So, so I think that's a journey in itself. And I think the next phase of this is actually to work way more closely with the functions um, to understand how we can support them better to, you know, to use the data as well. So this is really beginning. But if you have, if Stephanie, if you have, if you've been working on something similar, please get in touch. I would love to hear about your journey as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, Sam, I think we've got time for probably one more question. So, um, which one do you think we should we should tackle? Yeah, we have. We've got time for one more. And there was actually um, quite a related question. So it's like, has all the reporting that has been generated by this project influenced any decisions so far, or informed any decisions that you've made uh, as a business? Um, yes and no. I think what we what we are noticing is that um, you know 
for Digifit, for example, if we don't continue with things like uh, marketing campaigns, if we don't um, really try to drive engagement um, in a very strategic and tactful way, we run the risk of losing our audiences. And, and that is a, that is, it sounds like a very sort of obvious one to catch, but um, it's, it's good to catch now because we can start planning ahead for what, you know, what, what we can do to bring the people back in to really, um, you know, to really keep driving engagement. So I mentioned, for example, this workout plan probably wouldn't have come up on, onto our radar had we not been able to look at the data and see actually if, you know, we don't bring something into this, we don't, you know, drive it from a sort of senior level that, that we want all of our regions and opcos to, to really take the GFIT seriously, then potentially they're not going to. So, so I think those are the kinds of decisions we're starting to um, look at and, and certainly are, are helping us to continue framing our strategy going forward. Great, thanks. Yeah, that makes loads of sense. I mean, sometimes people won't act until they see the numbers staring them in the face, right? So yeah, yeah. That definitely makes sense. Cool. Well, um, thanks very much, uh, Nicole, for joining us. Sure, uh, I really enjoyed you. that. Could have gone on for another half an hour quite happily. So yeah, we might have to get you in to do another one. And uh, thanks as well, Toby, likewise. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody for joining. We'll send around the recording of this afterwards. There are still questions flying in, so we'll also pass those on to Nicole and Toby and get you some answers over to those as well. Um, and I just wanted to add uh, from my side as well. So we, we've just launched our new uh, LXP platform that came out last week. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, so questions coming in about skills frameworks, for example, that's part of this. A lot of the curation is all part of this. Um, and to find out what makes an LXP smart, just pop over to filtered.com or you can email me at sam.franklinfilter.com or just add me on LinkedIn. Happy to answer any questions you like. Otherwise, thanks again, Nicole and Toby for today. Thanks everybody. It was really great to be here. Take care. Yeah, thanks everyone hey, for attending. Oh, great questions. Day. Oops, sorry, okay. Toby. <laughs> I just said thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, great questions. Yeah, awesome to have you all here. Bye. Great. Thanks guys. See you later.